Okay. Good afternoon again. Before we start uh, the next session, I have a few announcements to make, uh, corrections. Uh, tomorrow morning, for those of you that plan to come tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning there was a mistake, uh, a, a, typical, a typical mistake in the, um, in the in, in, um, invitations. It's written there that registration will be until 8.30, and the first session will start at 10 o'clock, which is not logical, of course. So it, the registration will end by, 10, by 8.30, and the first session... Uh, will follow immediately. The first session will include the uh, defense minister and the uh, ninth president, the former president of Israel, uh, Shimon Peres. Uh, another uh, announcement that I would like to make, that, that is to encourage you to go, whenever it's possible, either today or tomorrow, to the showcase uh, startup tent that we have uh, next to this building. Uh, uh, and there are there some 50 startups of the, uh, some of the best startups in Israel. Now we are going to open the next session, which will uh, talk about uh, how we encourage start startups, what is the ecosystem of things like this, and I would like to invite um, Izar Shai, who is a partner in Knan uh, Venture Fund, Venture Capital Fund, uh, in Israel here, uh, an entrepreneur also. There is perhaps some contradiction between the two, but Israel, please. Thank you very much. Canaan, by the way, Canaan Partners. Um, I guess that answers the question whether do we speak in English or Hebrew in this panel. We are going to do it in English. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome the esteemed panel members who also are personal friends of mine. Um, I take the pleasure first to welcome Dr. Ona Berry. She is Corporate Vice President. Yeah, Ona, please. <laughs> Ona is Corporate Vice President of Growth and Innovation at EMC Centers of Excellence for EMEA and the United States. Dr. Berry is recognized as an entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience in the Israeli science, technology, and venture capital industries. I'm going to talk and you keep walking. That would make for a dramatic entrance. She was founding partner of Onet Data Communications. Uh, she held the position of chief scientist of the Ministry of Industry and Trade in the Israeli government. She served as a chairperson of the Israeli Venture Association. And she was also a venture partner at Gemini Israel Fund. Uh, as important as all of the above, most recently, Ona was the recipient of the Yakirat HaNegev, honorary of the Negev Award from the Ben Gurion University. That award recognized the owner's achievement and excellence in the technology industry as well as her successful entrepreneurship ventures and profound involvement in establishing an EMC R&D branch in the Negev region. We're going to talk about this. Welcome, Ona. Um, Yoav Tsuya. Yoav is a partner at JVP. Let's welcome Yoav. Okay. Yoav heads the JVP Cyber Labs. This is JVP's early stage investment vehicle aimed at identifying, nurturing, and building the next wave of cyber security and big data companies from Israel. JVP is one of Israel's leading VCs established in 1993. They manage more than a billion dollars and they have been active investors in cyber for about 13 years now. Yoav himself has 20 years of experience in uh, enterprise software, including this is C5i. That's the acronym? All right, we're in the world of cyber. C5I, and cybersecurity as well as in digital media and value-added services. Next in line, Yuval Shachar. Welcome, Yuval. Are you here? <laughs> Yuval, Yuval was the founder of Pentacom, PQ, both of which were acquired by Cisco. He's, he was a general manager at Cisco. He currently is a managing partner at Market LLC and at Innovation Endeavors, which is a prominent venture capital firm. And last but not least, Amir Orad. Where are you, Amir? All right. Amir, a successful CEO, entrepreneur, and investor advisor in the security and big data space. He was co-founder and red product and marketing in Sayota. That thing's the best, Sayota. 
Yeah. Do we have a minister in the government because of Sayota? Thank you for doing such a great job with him. Um, Sayota was an e-commerce security leader that was sold to RSA security, and until recently, Amir was the CEO for Actimize and grew it to become a $200 million business focusing on cyber and financial crime. Amir is also an investor and advisor in a number of startups in this space. This, yeah, this almost end my, ends my role as a speaker here. It will be your turn now, so thank you for joining us. And um, obviously, ladies first, Ona, um, you are running a big operation here in Israel and EMEA, and some of it deals with cyber and cyber security. Um, from a corporate perspective, a big player in the worldwide high-tech space, What's interesting for EMC in the area of cyber? So I think the interesting part for EMC, for the world of cyber, is IT. You know, IT and cloud computing in particular has many opening for attacks. So you need to uh, protect, to identify, and to recover that's basically IT normal operations. Great, so side before IT, and we will get back to you. I will ask you about specifics, as far as you could tell, about EMC's activities in cyber, especially in Israel. You have, um, thank you. You have, so cyber security, you are on the other side of, uh, of this, uh, this market, looking at very early stage opportunities. What's interesting for you? What makes you tick when you see a startup company approaching JVP, either for investment or for joining the incubator? So we've been investing in uh, cybersecurity since uh, 2001. And what um, you know, uh, moved us to uh, double up on the space and to engage with uh, all those great entrepreneurs that uh, the Israeli market is generating is the fact that we're seeing the landscape changing dramatically. We're seeing that the cybersecurity sector is moving from being a cost element for customers to becoming a business continuity must. And when we, you're taking notice of that, you, you see many, many new opportunities that are enabled on one hand by the need, the changing need on the IT and OT, the operational technology uh, itself, and on the other hand by those innovative uh, young people that come to us with all those groundbreaking ideas. So this is what we're looking for. And you know, just over the last year, we've invested in uh, uh, five new uh, cybersecurity startups. And we're looking I'm sorry, the number was five? Yep. OK. So those are five JVP new investments last year in the area of cyber. Let me challenge you on that. You and I spoke uh, earlier on, and you said that there are about, what, 250 cyber startups now in Israel, is that the number? Can you confirm? We saw over the last 24 months about 250 new cybersecurity companies in Israel. Okay, assuming that some of them, some of them are here to stay, some of them are trying to target uh, the, the novel idea of becoming big companies, some of them will have to exit. How many of those 250 companies will actually become successful cyber companies? I think that the statistics in cybersecurity in terms of uh, the distribution of the success rate of companies is not different than any other uh, uh, segment in the market. Uh, we do see, however, that the quality of startup is a bit uh, differently distributed than in other sectors. We see uh, a lot of very, very good companies, quite a bit of, uh, I would say, entrepreneurs that need to maybe rethink some of their ideas. We, we don't see a lot of uh, these uh, thick belly that you see in uh, many other uh, sectors. So we're actually obviously focusing on the leading uh, innovative companies. By the way, those five companies that we invested in, we hope that all of them will become you know, very successful and large companies. But at the end of the day, uh, that's part of the business of doing early stage investment. Non not all of them will become uh, like uh, CyberArk, for example, uh, which is one of our leading companies in the space, uh, which is now uh, you know, doing their process for an IPO. But uh, um, so not all of them will become successful. Part of the you know, um, uh, idea of investing in early stage is to take risk, to take those risks that about the technology, about the people, about the market need, 
And that's what, part of what we're doing in Be'er Sheva. All right, so I noticed that you didn't give me a number, but we'll try to get back to you on that later. But you're optimistic, at least about those five companies that you have invested in. Okay, you know, to make this interesting, I'll go to you, Amir. Uh, yep. You typically stand on the other side, which is the entrepreneurs, the people who actually run the show, the people who actually work hard in order to make it happen. Um, let's just see over here. If we can see this, how many entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs are there in this audience? People who would be running cybersecurity companies? All right, so at least half of the audience here uh, is on your side of the fence. Um, what do you see today? What makes for a successful cyber entrepreneur? So it's a very long, I can have a very long answer, but trying to distill it. First of all, having a real product offering versus a very niche feature. I see many people coming with a great idea for a very specific solution, for a very specific feature that is not a big enough product. So if you're thinking about something, make sure it's big enough to justify the time and pain of an institution to go and deploy it. The second one is, if you have an amazing product, make sure it's actually something you can deploy at an institution, because I see people coming in with something that will serve a government, because of their army experience, much more than a commercial institution. So it's a, a genius idea, but it's not something you can actually take into the field. And lastly, people come and say, you know, we served in the army, we saw this Godzilla attack, and we have the anti-Godzilla uh, solution. Um, but most people have never seen a Godzilla, don't know what a Godzilla is, and we never see one. So you have to make it relevant for the next 24 months. If it's something very futuristic that no one can relate to, it's probably not something that I would invest in or help or invest time in at this uh, right now. Now, you work a lot and advise startup companies. Do you have a typecast for a, a cybersecurity entrepreneur? I would focus on those coming from Israel because we are in the local scene here, but what would be a successful typecast for an Israeli cyber entrepreneur? Specifically, do I have to be a Shmone Matai graduate? Do I have to have friends uh, in all kind of eight XXX units and so on in order to be successful? I think actually not having a single DNA is part of the trick. So if everyone came from the same unit, have seen the same things, they're much less likely to succeed. If you have a mix of business people or product people, have seen clients, can talk the business language, and techies, and you mix the two together, they're much more likely to succeed. And I would say the biggest tip is if you're coming from the technology side, marry with someone, find someone, partner with someone that is on the business side, can speak to clients, understand that lingo, Otherwise, it's very difficult to cross that chasm. Thank you. So back to you, Yuval. You crossed the lines. You were very successful entrepreneurs. You ran operations for a large company. You are, you are now an investor. What are the attributes you would be looking for when looking at a cyber startup, a cyber opportunity? So I, I would say, at least from my perspective, I feel it's the first time where I think we can build truly big companies as opposed to uh, build a technology company and then sell it for the technology. And as an entrepreneur, I've all, all, often been on the defensive on panels like this saying, why do you sell your companies instead of building a big company? And the answer used to be that there wasn't a deep enough bench. There is a very, very strong technology group in Israel. And with that technology group, you build a product and a vision and you start selling and you get to 10 and 20 or 30 million dollars a year, to build it up from there, um, you start to need the same kind of talent that would operate, market, sell. Initially, you find a few good people. When you try to build a big company, finding the amount of uh, operating talent used to be very hard to do. And I think um, today, a lot of this talent has come out of acquisitions where they've worked for U.S. or other corporations um, and got into the discipline of how to run a company, how to run different aspects, not just technology. And um, for the first time, I think my passion is to hook up with entrepreneurs that are well-rounded, not just technology, that identify a big enough problem that might not be possible to solve, but if it's solvable, that it could create a category-leading company. All right, so you, it sounds like you are all excited about cyber and cybersecurity and the opportunity that is entailed within security and cyber. Um, I would like to become more specific. If you could think about one area 
that makes you tick. One area in cyber where you believe there is a big opportunity. We all have heard all kinds of buzzwords in recent years. Everything between RPT to SCADA to I don't know what. Um, if you could name a segment that makes your company excited or you as investors or somebody who advises companies, what would that sector be? Uh, start with you, Ona. I think that uh, you know the answer because you come from this space yourself. It's not going to be a single segment. The, the, out, of the, uh, the, the out of the mix of technology and business here is that you're actually facing a very rapidly changing scene and you need some fundamental technologies, data science and such, of course, but basically you want your systems to continuously improve their, their resilience because it's very much like our life in the Middle East. We're on our toes getting up uh, to every noise because we know something is happening. The same happens with cybersecurity. You're on your toes, you, you invent something smart, the, the bad guys invent something smart there, so you need to continue, so, so it's a continuous process. And I wouldn't say one segment, I would say integration of multiple types of segments and changing all the time to improve the protection for the good guys and to harden the work for the bad guys. So continuous work and analysis, you have anything that makes you excited? So I, I definitely agree with Orna that there is no uh, single type of solution that we're actively looking for as the next silver bullet for cybersecurity. There's no such thing, okay? But uh, um, I think that uh, what you know, we are looking for in the pitch of any startups that we're engaged with is to understand how they're going to dramatically change the rules of the game in cybersecurity. Because if you think about it, and let's uh, try to uh, um, uh, express it in economical fashion, you know, the, the, the economical landscape of cybersecurity is dramatically unbalanced. The hackers have an easy life, okay? They can take as much time as they want, they can test their solutions against the defender's uh, infrastructure. These are off-the-shelf products that they can just buy and try to, uh, uh, you know, evade and uh, go around with, which you know, the, 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 the cost of launching a new attack, for example, on a, on a bank, uh, is very low. It's hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. You could just, uh, you know, take off-the-shelf tools, tweak them a bit, and here you go, you have a new attack that is uh, evading the IDSs, the IPS, the, 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 certainly the antiviruses and firewalls and so forth. The cost of defending against this type of attack, which you don't know when it will come, from where it will come, what new tools will be integrated, what evading mechanisms will be integrated into all of this it is very high. We're talking about a ratio of a thousand to one. Okay, for each dollar the bad guys are investing, you need to invest probably a thousand dollars, if not much more, to uh, protect against those. And the question is, can you change the rules of the game? Can you make it hard enough? You can never you know, stop an attacker completely. Okay, they'll always find a way if they have enough resources. But you, can you make it difficult enough for them when launching a new attack, attack when targeting a certain customer, a certain target, uh, so that they will think of going somewhere else or just you know, going out of the business of hacking certain types of organization. So this is what we're looking for and there are many such like opportunities, market needs and addressing technologies that actually uh, tie into that theme. Thank you, Yav. Uh, Yuval, any special areas that you have in mind? Um, I would say advanced targeted attacks at this point is an area of interest for me just because the, the outcome of those attacks is so potentially devastating and um, it's probably one of the more challenging um, intellectually in terms of providing the right kind of defense. Um, and we at least believe that the, the market opportunity is huge um, and has not even been scraped at this point. I would say otherwise beyond the traditional areas, like many I think I am intrigued by this whole world of Internet of Things um, and automotive and um, the world of industrial defense for similar reasons. And in some of them, the challenge for an investor is to time the market correctly because it's a little bit early to be able to grow a company at this point in those spaces. 
At the same time, we believe that if you um, look at those spaces early enough, then you could create security by design, and then as the field evolves, it will be evolved around some healthy security principles uh, that can be managed. Thank you, Val. So, Amir, I'll give you a chance to answer the same, but also adding to that, many successful Israeli cyber companies were successful because of selling to financial institutions, mainly in the United States. Maybe this is the kind of segmentation we are looking for in order to build successful companies. Maybe you look at the type of customers and not only about the solution to the problem that you are trying to, to address. I wonder what your thoughts are. Okay, so two very different questions. The first one on where we would invest. We need to understand that the CIO or the CISO has endless potential technologies to deploy. So when I hear someone saying, I have a product that solves a real problem in a real way, there are literally dozens of potential projects, and they can do only two, three, five at a given moment. So why would the CIO invest in your product versus another product? Either it's just the easiest one to deploy, so it's as good as the average, but the easiest to deploy, or it makes him dramatically more efficient, effective, you know, it becomes a hero in the organization, or it solves a real problem that is coming from the top. You know, if the CEO phone was hacked, he's probably going to invest in that area. Even though it may not be the right one for the company, there's pressure internally. But you have to think about the client because there are literally dozens, hundreds, thousands maybe, of things they can do in the space that are all valid. That's how I would look at the companies and are they worth the time or not. To the second question, yes, if you look at Israel specifically, Sayota, Trustir, Actimize, which is slightly different, all succeeded mainly by focusing on the fintech uh, area. And the reason is, is very simple. Number one, that's where the money is. If you look at the attacks, besides the state national level attacks, they're going after uh, assets and things they can steal and monetize, and money is there, you know, there's money there. Number two, after government and military institutions, the banks are the biggest targets in the market because both nations like to bridge them. We hear JPMC is potentially a state-level uh, target. Estonia was hacked during the war back in, uh, with the Soviet Union. And um, they have the biggest pain point. And number three, banks are willing, to, they're sophisticated enough, they're willing to take risks and use small startups because they don't have a choice. So they are attacked all the time, and I'm sure you see it, EMC now, RSA, you see it all the time. They're attacked all the time, very sophisticated. They have the, the bandwidth and the assets to try various things, and they know they need innovation all the time, so they will take the risk and try startup. A law firm or a school potentially is not as attacked, we don't have as much to lose, and we don't have the bandwidth to try new things. Thank you. But I, I, want to, I want to add something. The, it's true that the banks are willing, are able to pay because the translation of attacks is, is to dollars, but the, the distribution of information and the cloud that I mentioned earlier, assume that your, your relative is going into, into a surgery and they, they need to receive some blood infusion and somebody is tweaking with their name. So not everything is measured by money. The more information you have, the more regulation you have, and the more obligation you have, to retain a certain level of integrity of the information. So I agree that you can develop certain technologies, be it for the defense that is willing to, to pay or be it for the banks, but at the end of the day, issues related to privacy, to integrity, and to use of massive amount of information are regulating your ability to protect them. So it's, as it so happens in other spaces where we invest, you're looking for the most significant pain, for the most costly pain, where people are, find, are striving to find solutions, and this is where you would beat companies, if I could paraphrase on, on you, Amir. Um, you mentioned three successful Israeli cyber companies, Transteer, Sayota, and Optimize, all of which were acquired by larger companies, which brings us to the point of how do you build companies that would last? Not that there is anything wrong with selling your company for $600 million, we are all for it, but the question is, how do we also try to build large cyber security entities? And uh, I think that uh, we have now one example which is on its way to go public. You have, I will go to you. This is a company called the CyberArk, which is not, all, not uh, rumored anymore, right? CyberArk cyber will go public, is that right? Are you allowed to 
to say to name the name of CyberArk? Yeah, so uh, CyberArk is uh, indeed a company of ours. We uh, uh, it filed uh, to go public a few weeks back. Uh, actually, an interesting ticker CYBR. So we hope C -Y Cyber. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's our hopes that. Uh, so give us the formula. You know, we had Checkpoint, we had, I think, Imperva, and that's about it for public entities in the cyberspace, so we, and now We invested CyberArk. in the company uh, in 2001. The company is, uh, uh, has been on the road for quite a while. Uh, great entrepreneurs coming from uh, certain army technology units with uh, the core technology. They started with uh, one product, which was the vaults, essentially for keeping uh, digital uh, documents and such uh, uh, under safe protection and so forth. And then they, the market actually showed them uh, what should be the next generation of product, which are privileged identity management and privileged session management. And they uh, listened to the market, shifted their product mix a bit, uh, and uh, started to address uh, different uh, segments. Uh, financial market definitely is uh, one of them. Uh, they have more than 1,500 customers nowadays um, and uh, ramping up very nicely, profitable company. Um, so I think that uh, they uh, identified in time certain dramatic changes that occurred in the market. So the APT uh, approach uh, was definitely uh, one of the key drivers for their growth over the last uh, few years. Uh, you know, in every attack chain there is always uh, or typically there is a, a stage where the attacker tries to do privilege escalation, tries to hack into those privileged accounts, take advantage of them to perform whatever they're trying to perform. Uh, this is where CyberArk kicks in. They protect those uh, uh, privileged uh, accounts. Another uh, you know, key driver that uh, um, created some regulation and compliance issues was uh, the works of Edward Snowden, right? So uh, third party, IT manager had a privileged account. He went into the NSA and, and you know, uh, stole whatever documents he stole, and then distributed to whoever he wanted to distribute it. Again, these are these are exactly the kind of things that CyberArk uh, protects against, and therefore, uh, the management of the company, which are by the way still the founders, okay, which is another. So the kind founder of, is still the CEO of the, the company. The founder is still the CEO, which is another interesting thing because uh, typically. Give us his name. He is, his he name deserves. Is, uh, yeah, the CEO is Udi Mukadi. He's been with the company since its inception. Udi from Mukadi. From, yes. Okay. He's uh, splitting in times between. Yeah, he definitely uh, deserves that round of applause. He's splitting his time between Boston and Israel. We still still have the majority of the companies located here in Petah Tikva. Uh, the company didn't go and uh, look for an external CEO to actually sort of take it to the next step. It's, as sometimes you're you're doing, uh, or a VC would do. We, we believe in that entrepreneur. We uh, let him steer the company, and he performed very, very nicely. So, Yuval and Amir, I'm going to ask you in a second, how do you help build the next big Israeli cyber company? But just before this, you have, did you always know that this company was going to become a big, independent cyber security company, or, or this just happens? You, you cannot, uh, I cannot say that we always knew that it will become a huge success, okay, that it is today, but, um, I think that we always saw the uh, way that, uh, that Udi managed the company as uh, the right way to manage the company, building it one step after the other, listening to your customers, addressing real market needs, coming up with new products at the right time, not ahead of the market, not after everyone else is already coming up with similar products, incorporating great technology but not overdoing it, not focusing only on the technology and uh, leaving aside the product and the marketing side. So the company grew year over year significantly, and uh, so we, we, we felt, and we relative, uh, to a certain degree, we knew that it would become a large company. We didn't uh, know whether it would be picked up earlier or someone would uh, issue an offer or that we'll take it all the way to an IPO, but certainly uh, over the last few years, uh, we knew that it's heading in the right direction. In fact, we. Uh, uh, together with Goldman Sachs, we did a secondary transaction where we bought some of the older, tired investors because we, uh, we felt that the company is going in the right way and that it will eventually be uh, a true market leader. Great. So, Amir, how do you help build big companies? What, what do you give them? So 
maybe before that, I just want to relate, I think there are two different types of exits that you're mentioning. There are companies that came out of Israel and were sold, take uh, Sayota RSA, for example. They're still running and actually leading the RSA space in that area out of Israel with Israeli leadership, with IP that is born here, hundreds of people um, employed by EMC today. So that's, a, to me, a much more helpful, positive exit than a company that dissolves and disappears, right? People are leaving, IP is spreading, and you lose the company. Actimize part of Nice Today is the same thing. Trustee may become IBM cyber uh, you know, center in Israel. It may disappear and dissolve. If it's the latter, it's really bad for the Israel. If it's the former, it's much healthier. So I think we should not um, overly complain about some of those outcomes because they're healthy for the economy, healthy for the people, and many good people and good companies come out of those companies later on, and that helps the ecosystem. Now to your question, I think in security, the way to scale the companies, you get initially the early adopters, and you can do very well in commando mode, get the early adopters, solve a problem, become a hero, great. Then you start scaling, and scaling sucks. It's difficult, it's painful, you need different skill sets, it's no longer some guy thinking you know, in the office or in the shower how to solve a problem. It's massive scale. And some of those um, skill sets we don't have. And most people don't have. And you need to bring them in on time. You bring the scalable guy early on, it kills the company. You bring him too late, you're, you're already dead. So you have to bring it at the right time. In security, the brand power is extremely powerful. If you're known as the trusted entity to solve APT, to solve breach detection, to solve whatever, you'll be the winner because people will follow that brand. If you're not that brand, you'll be one out of many, and then you need massive sales and marketing, and it never ends. So Israeli companies that became the name for, and notice Trustee was the number one in its space, Sayota RSA was the number one, Cyberlock owns a very clear niche, they own it. If you can own a niche, build a brand, and scale, you're in for a good run. Great, Yuval, would you invest in a company where you know that the likelihood for an IPO is uh, minimal to none, but this is still a good company, which uh, may uh, run through a successful exit sometime over the next few years? Um, the short answer is yes, but um, you know, if you truly build value and you create a market, then um, IPO is, is a natural path to follow um, and continue to grow the company. Um, it is by far more interesting, I think, long-term than um, building a company and selling it off quickly. Although purely as an investor, if you can invest $5 million in a company and in one to two years sell it for $150 million, um, it's a great return. You can do this all day long. Um, eventually, I think there is a first generation of those companies that are out there now. A lot of them will get sold for 50, 100, 150. I think um, those entrepreneurs in their next generation will be the ones that create the companies um, that would grow and could become big public companies or standalone companies, public or not. Thank you. So as we are getting closer to the end of this panel, I will risk myself by asking you some sort of a controversial question. Uh, so I will cons consolidate feedback I have heard uh, quite a few times in, uh, in recent times, which is, uh, cyber is overhyped. Too many overhyped. Too many companies, too many bright entrepreneurs going to solve the same problems time and time again. APT, SCADA, Endpoint, um, you name it, all kind of issues that many people are trying to solve. Are we not already beyond the hype curve the hype curve? And I do realize that we are sitting here in a cyber security workshop and conference, so my apologies. Um, but how do you address that? I think that uh, hyped might be a, a matter of price, but the topic is not overhyped. Uh, this reminds me that uh, less, less than 10 years ago, it's about uh, nine or eight years ago, that people thought that uh, defending um, the, um, the homeland is not related to defense. It's a homeland security, and this is not defense. I don't think, I don't think that uh, you can say that today, and uh, uh, everybody, everybody recognizes the importance of uh, Iron Dome for the defense, because you cannot 
have a, a war where the back for where your home is, is being uh, jeopardized. I think that the topic of cyber is by all means, uh, it's in infancy. It's going to consume far more energy in order to be able to maintain uh, the know-how on digital infrastructure and to um, basically face the, the um, intrusion, the continuous attempts to, to use, misuse the, the information for malicious uh, reasons, be it defense, or be it uh, commercial, or be it health, or be it anything else. So, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think that uh, anything is hyped. I think that we're beginning to use uh, the digital infrastructure, the massive amount of information, the machine learning capabilities, and everything that we understand about psychology and the human mind in order to define in this context continuously remedies for evolving situation. And consequently, we're at the beginning. So we are just starting. You have back to you still 250 companies over the last two years. So many of them will not uh, make it to the end line. Are we hyped, overhyped, or are we still in the right path? So I think that if you look at the characteristic of a hype cycle, uh, there are some uh, you know, basic elements that are common to different uh, such cycles. First of all, is high multiples for uh, public companies in the in the space. Some would say unjustified uh, multiples. Uh, you see a lot of entrepreneurs going into that. You see a lot of money uh, of investor in being invested in the space. Uh, and you see a complete disproportion between all of these to the actual market need. So I think that the first thing that you need to notice about uh, cyber, the cyber cycle is that the market need is actually dramatic. It's huge, okay? The market need is, is something that we didn't have in previous kind of bubble or hype cycles. Here we see a real market need in both IT and OT that is uh, underlined by, for example, just think of the number of connected devices, okay? We're talking about I don't know, two billion or so people that are connected to the internet today. There are about 50 billion devices that are addressable uh, today. You know, this was not true a few years ago, okay? Think about uh, the enterprise, right? The boundaries of an enterprise. Who are the trusted users? Who are the trusted computers? What, are, what is the perimeter of the enterprise with cloud, mobile, and so forth? You know, all of these things are changing constantly. So I think that the first thing to notice about cyber cycle is that the market need is real. Still, I think that uh, a not, definitely not all of those 250 companies are uh, a, a, will make it to the end line. Most of them will not. Uh, we see a lot of overlap. We see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that are still not ripe in terms of uh, uh, their maturity, uh, in terms of understanding the market, understanding the customer needs, and so forth. But I think that the cyber uh, technology market is here to stay. It will actually grow over the next few years, in my uh, opinion, a few uh, times over the next few years, and we'll see more and more needs that are actually addressed by those uh, startups. Thank you. So, Yuval and uh, Amir, assuming that you will be as optimistic, uh, my closing question to you would be, and you feel free to, to state your optimism about cyber if you wish, but my closing question to you, and then I'll get back to you with the same question, is one or two specific pieces of advice you would give to the entrepreneurs in the audience as they go about building their own companies, give them one or two tips as to how to become successful CEOs, successful entrepreneurs in this huge cyberspace? So, um, first, I do feel that the, the space is a little bit overhyped. And um, so, it's not that I'm not optimistic or disagree with Ornar Yav, but I think um, when I look at the 250 companies, most of which are first time entrepreneurs, most of which are very early in the game, and many of which have been raising quite a bit of money very early in the game, that's a sign that the market is a little bit overhyped. And if there was one piece of advice I would um, hand out, it is, I think 80% of the problem is to correctly define the problem. And if I hear criticism from, uh, I would say, US VCs about the Israeli tech, it's often that we build the greatest solutions and then go out searching for the problem. I think at the, at the initial phases, just before getting funded, 
or as you get funded, um, spend the time to completely understand the problem. Because once you do, you will go build the greatest solutions. That is uh, very clear. So I want to relate to the hype. I think we're underhyping cyber, but we have an inflation of companies. We're two different things. So we have an inflation of startups, which is typical in the market at this stage. But I don't think we understand the cyber risk. And I want to give five examples, each one two seconds. Someone sabotaged a nuclear plant with a cyber tool. Okay. Someone stole the Lockheed Martin plans for the future plane with a cyber attack. In the last two weeks alone, the largest bank in the U.S. was penetrated probably by a nation. In the last two weeks alone, we had pictures, private pictures of most celebrities stolen. In the last two weeks alone, 70 million cars were stolen from Home Depot and before that target. And in those two weeks, we learned that our mobile device will be our wallet and it will have data from the watch about our you know, medical status. That's how important and how real that uh, environment is. So we're running out of time and you have convinced us it's a bad world out there. Give us an advice. Be focused, be practical, give value add, and make it very easy to deploy because people are surrounded with tools that are too difficult to use. Excellent. You have one last piece of advice? I just want uh, one sentence. I think uh, an entrepreneur should really try and simplify their pitch, right? You know, they need to make it understandable. I mean, we can go... Uh, as deep as needed into the technology and into the business practices and so forth. But at the end of the day, what people, customers, partners relate the most to is a simple pitch. So find a way to express the you know, very interesting technology, very advanced technology that you have into a simple pitch that can be understandable by customers and partners. Thank you. You have an honor. The last word. Find the best investors who understand the space and can guide you very well when to start partnerships so you will succeed. And you forgot to mention that some of them are sitting right here, so find the right investors. Thank you very much. And to, uh, and to my left too. Okay, thank you. Amir Orat, Yuval Shachar, Yoav Tsuya, Dr. Rona Berry. Thank you very much. It's a big world out there. Go get it. Thank you. Thank you.